Um, welcome, uh, North Texas Tableau User Group August event. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. So Joey, I'm going to bring you in for this one. Uh, folks who have kind of attended our meetings before have seen this slide, familiar with it, but for those of you that are new or haven't attended before, uh, we like to talk about uh, kind of the goals of our community and uh, what we're about here, um, the North Texas User Group. Yeah. Um, so you know, probably the most important thing here is to have fun, right? So if you've ever been to a Tableau conference, Tableau is all about celebration of data and having fun, right? So that's the most important thing in my opinion is just let's, let's as a community come together, talk about data and have fun doing it. Uh, also, uh, we're here to collaborate, right? So uh, with everything being virtual now, we have the opportunity to, to have speakers from outside of our community and um, to bring their ideas because everyone uses tools differently. So definitely uh, the ability to, to collaborate is one of the goals of this community. Absolutely. Um, you know, networking, right? Um, you know, it's easier <laughs> when we're doing in-person events to, to network and know your neighbor and, and know the other organizations that are that are attending, but um, it's something we encourage you guys to do still through our, our LinkedIn page or on Twitter. Um, you'll never know when that contact right will come in handy if you're ever job searching or or shoot maybe they are. Um, and also spread the word, right? Uh, I think this community is, is most effective um, when we get the the most amount of people involved, right? So the more ideas, the more brain power we have in the room, the more effective we become as as a group and as a community. And uh, finally, I kind of want to hit the point of, right, this is your community, uh, North Texas folks. Uh, we, we'd love your feedback. We'd like to hear kind of what you think and what you want to see in future meetings. You know, Joey and I and, and Stephen, we're, we're the administrators of the group. We, we kind of organize it for you, but um, your feedback really determines the format, the topics, and the things we cover. So uh, love to hear that. And, uh, you know, feel free to ping us anytime with what you, what you want to see more of or less of. All right, so before we get uh, into the agenda today, I do want to make a quick note of a project that Joey and I have been working on called the Visitor Studio. So uh, just a shameless plug here. So uh, if you're on YouTube at all, go check this out. This is, you know, part data viz interview, part tutorial, um, 10, 15 minute long videos where we, uh, interview someone from the community and they show us a little demo about one of their visits. Uh, we have a couple episodes out there now and I might have lost it because of my connection. Nope, here we go. So Stephen was our first one and we followed that up with uh, Tableau Zen Master Lindsay Betzendahl. So go check those out if you haven't already. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the agenda for today. If it loads. Why that's loading real quick. We actually, uh, we're recording our third episode tomorrow, which is going to be uh, Eric Balash. And we're going to talk about that's, right. is, that's out there on Tableau Public. So uh, that episode should be out hopefully within the next week. Yeah, of course the agenda is not going to load for me. <laughs> Let's just do this. All right, there we go. All right, so we have two guests lined up today. Uh, Kate Brown is our first get featured guest today. So she is from Skillsoft and one of the uh, user group leaders from Boston. Uh, folks that were with us a couple months ago might recognize her name. Uh, she's one of the like I said, the user group leaders from Boston, who we had a um, co-tug with, um, I believe in June, a few months back. And then uh, after Kate, uh, Mark Bradborn, who is a solutions uh, consultant, or I'm sorry, Mark, if I butchered that, he is with Tableau. He's gonna show us some common ways to overcome uh, some, some worst case scenario requirements from your uh, users and your stakeholders within your organization. Uh, I've seen both these presentations. I love both of them. And I thought uh, 
thought our community here in North Texas would enjoy them as well. So with that, I'm going to bring Kate in. Kate, are you with us? I am. Perfect. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for coming to hang out with us and sharing your uh, your Tableau prep uh, presentation with us today. Oh, you are not Mark. Sorry about that. <laughs> Man, technical difficulties all over the place today. Jeez. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, Boston uh, Boston Tug Co. Lead. I understand you're a big golfer, right? As well. I am. Yep. Yeah. That's what I'd to, rather to do than anything and... else. Yeah, I play, um, usually play Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday, Sunday. So I play a fair awesome. amount. So you're, wow, you're a very happy golfer then. You're out there yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. So what I will do at this point is uh, stop sharing my screen. I'll let you, uh, let you kick it off here. All right. Should be good to go. Just bring up. Yeah, you were awesome. That over there. And so thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Um, as Tim said, my name is Kate Brown. I am, I live just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I am a business intelligence manager at a company called Skillsoft in Boston. Uh, we're an e-learning company. And I use uh, SQL, Tableau Desktop, and Tableau Prep on a regular basis. Um, in prior roles, I've used uh, for databases, I've used SQL Server, I've used Teradata, and Oracle. I used Oracle a lot. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Prep and Desktop. Uh, I feel like I'm, I've kind of become known as a Prep person, um, and I've developed a strange love for cleaning messy data. Um, outside of work, I love to travel. Uh, one of my favorite trips, uh, this is a picture of me hiking down from Dune Angus, uh, which is an old fort on uh, Innish Moor, which is one of the Aran Islands off the coast of Galway, Ireland. Um, I was there in 2018. I can't wait to go back. With COVID, I have no idea when that will be, um, but at least I've got some great pictures to remind myself of how beautiful it was there. I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I also have a blog um, called Fairways and Viz. Um, I'm doing a lot of blog posts now, a series about prep and SQL. So if you're learning prep and you wanna learn SQL, it translates, you do this in prep, this is how you would do it in SQL. Um, so if you have any topics on that that you're interested in, uh, please feel free to reach out to me either on Twitter or LinkedIn. And if you do follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I do um, talk a lot about golf and my dog. I have a, we have a rescue Sharpe. Um, I also have a husband, I just don't tweet about him too much. So today what I wanna do is talk to you about four reasons I use prep a lot. Um, and in a prior role, um, I used Oracle, but I did not have right access to my database. So for anyone out there who is used to having that, imagine having that, and having that taken away from you. And then the scenario I was in was that I needed data from Teradata, I needed data from Oracle, I had uh, CSV files and Excel files, and really nowhere to kind of join that data uh, together without having right access to a database. So I was almost resorting to going to Microsoft Access, uh, but Tableau Prep had come out right after um, I started in that role and I had done some beta testing, so I knew it was actually going to meet my needs. So I've been using prep for a long time. Um, if you used it a couple of years ago and you're like, oh, this isn't for me, I'd say take another look at it. Um, the, the prep team has just been churning out enhancements and they're really interested in customer feedback and how they can make it um, a tool for everyone to use. So the number one reason that I love prep is that there are over 50 different types, uh, connector types. So you can bring an Excel file, a CSV file, um, a custom SQL from a SQL server, and you can join those all together in prep and do that manipulation, cleaning, and aggregating within the tool, which I think is just phenomenal. The other cool thing about prep is that you can union different sources. Um, so you can't really union, I don't know of a database that so you can union different database sources, uh, but you can do that in prep. So take a look at the connectors 
Um, there's also ODBC and JDBC if there's something that you need that isn't in there. But chances are um, most of what you're going to want to use is in there. So the second reason that I love PrEP is that you can point and click um, and do all sorts of cleaning. So you don't need to write regex to keep certain fields. You don't have to jump through hoops to clean it. And you know it's great because oftentimes we're getting data that may be messy. So maybe we're looking at addresses and some have street and some have ST. Maybe we're looking at um, city data. So in the city of Boston, there's a neighborhood called West Roxbury. And some places you're gonna see that with West Roxbury. Others you're gonna see W period Roxbury. Others you're gonna see W space Roxbury. And prep, and we're gonna jump in in a second, it's really easy just to point and click and clean that. You can change data types, remove letters, trim extra spaces, all with the click of the mouse. And it's pretty handy. So we're gonna jump into prep and I'm gonna show you some cleaning tips. So what I've got here is just um, the city of Boston has open data sets. So every now and then I pull some stuff down and play around with it. So this data set is um, all of the liquor licenses that have been issued in the city of Boston. So when I scan across, I notice a couple of things right away um, that look a little odd to me. So this address right here, if you see, you can see all of these look like they have an extra space in front of them. And to get rid of that space, I'm just gonna click on the field. I'm gonna open this uh, more options menu. This menu is really powerful and it's gonna be where most of your cleaning steps are. And when you open that up, we're gonna get clean. And then there's this remove extra spaces. So when I click on that, it's gonna take a second to go through and all of my extra spaces have now been removed. The other thing I noticed is that over here, let's just bring this one over. You can see my opening and closing. You can see I got 10 a.m. here. I've got 10 a.m. without a space here. And we can group these. So if you're used to desktop, right, you know, you can create a group and you can manually select them. So let's try and do this. Let's come over here and let's go to clean and, oops, sorry, let's go to group values and let's go common characters. So you've got some options here where you can do manual, you can do pronunciation, common characters or spelling. We're gonna check common characters and let's see how prep groups them. Oh no, something happened, my 10 a.m.s are gone. Now what I can do is come in here, because I'm gonna guess they're in here, and I can uncheck them. So that didn't really work the way that I wanted it to, but if something groups in there, you can just come in and remove that, and it's gonna remove it from your grouping. So we're gonna hit done there. All of my changes are gonna be over here in my changes panel. So let's say I don't want that. I can come over here and remove it. And my point of showing you this is like that you can play around with these and you know come in and try some of these other ways to clean and group them. Group values and let's try spelling. And it's going to group everything in there. So it didn't work. Maybe a bad example. Um, but you've got the point that you can come in here and play around and group those together. The other thing that you can do is actually um, split fields pretty easily in prep, and then you can group these. So let's try the city with the grouping instead. So let's go to group values and let's do spelling. And now that works much better. So when we come into Boston, we can see our Bostons with the upper and lower case are done. Now I could do, um, I'm just gonna undo that. What I could have done here too is just made everything uppercase. So if I come back over here to clean and I can just make uppercase. And now that's gonna make them all uppercase, which would also group those together. Now the other thing I notice here is my zip code right? This should be a zip code. I know all of my zip codes start with a zero up here. So it looks like there's something going on with this. 
Um, this is going to show me the histogram, but if I actually want to see all the values, I can just click details. Now that is not what I want because I need that zero. So what I can do is just come back here and I can, this is going to be the input of where I set my data source. And if I come down here, I can change this. And I'm going to change that to a string from a number. And now if I go back, And we go back over to our zip. Now I can see my zeros back. And I can also see that I've got this little button up here that I didn't have before. And what this is doing is this is prep is making some recommendations on that field. So when I click on this, oh, it's saying, hey, this looks like it might be a zip code. So I'm going to change this to a zip code. And now this is set as a zip code. And you can see here that it's got that zip code right next to that. And when I bring this into desktop, it's going to automatically recognize that as a zip code. Now I could do the same over here. Let's see what this one's doing. And it's saying, okay, we want to change that to a state. And we can change that now. And now we can also change this to a city. And now my city, state, and zip code, when I bring these into desktop, already have these predefined rules with them which is pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna jump back over into PowerPoint. And the number three reason that I love prep is unions. So I don't know how many of you write unions in SQL, but when you do that, you know, your field types need to be the same. You have to have the same number of columns. You know, everything really needs to be the same in what you're doing for a union. Prep is much more flexible in the union. And so I'm just going to open up another flow. And I pre-built uh, just a couple of Excel files for this example. And if anyone is interested in getting these flows, um, you know, just reach out to me and I'm more than happy to package them and send them to you. So I've got one file in here um, that's an Excel file and I'm going to add another one. And so we're going to just grab our union two file. And now when I bring this in, this is an Excel file and I can see that I've got three tabs. So the first thing that I'm going to show you for a union is how to union on your data source. So I'm just going to drag out the February tab. And this is my input section. And what I'm going to say is I am going to I'm going to do a wildcard union. And I'm not going to wildcard card files for this, but I am going to wildcard my sheets. So I want to union all of my sheets into one source. And what I notice in my name is that they all end in transaction. So down here, what I can do is I can set my pattern. So I'm going to just do star transaction and star. So obviously, you know, if you're going to do a matching pattern, make sure, you know, if you're pulling in files that are all in the same location, just pay attention. You know, is this going to bring in something that I don't want? Um, and then if I hit apply, now what you're going to notice is if you notice the difference between these right here, this is just a single. And now I've got this plus symbol right here, which indicates that I've got all of these in here. And now if I add a clean step, which is where we're going to look at our data, for both of these. You'll see here um, that I also will now have a new, um, a new field called table names, and this is going to reflect the names of the tab. So you can union in an input, and now what we can do is we can union these together. And so to union it, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click and drag this up. And when you've got that little box that says union kind of shaded in orange, if you release your mouse, it's going to create a union step. Now, this is great because my field names do not match between my files. And the way that I know that is I've got nine mismatching fields from 11 fields. And it's going to show me here, you know, that these really aren't matching. But what I can do is add a clean step and let's inspect our data and see what we've got going on here. So I know I have two fields, uh, two files, and if I look at this, I can say, okay, when I click on uh, the January, I can say, okay, this is how my January data set up. So in January's file, it's called month. 
but then it looks like for my other files, uh, my other files have the month as month name. So I want to bring those together, and it's really easy in prep. I'm going to click on this field, I'm going to hold down my mouse, and I'm going to drop it on top of month, and it's going to merge those. So now all of my months are together. And then we'll repeat that. So what I can do is location and region, merge those together in my total and my transactions. I'll merge those together. My year looks like it's pretty good. Um, and then I don't need these fields. I don't need my file path. I don't need my table names and I don't need this file generated by so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of those and remove them. And now they've removed them from my flow. And if I ever needed to bring them back, I can open up my pane and I can see where those are and I could uncheck that and keep them. So I don't know um, if you guys are excited about this, but when I learned that I could union and not have to make sure that everything was perfect up, upstream of my union, I was really excited and maybe that's just the data cleaning geek in me, um, but I thought this was great. So hopefully someone out there is excited as I am about that. And then the fourth reason that I love prep is um, I always try and aggregate my data and bring only the detail records that I need into desktop. You know, to really have a good performing um, workbook, we really want to make sure that we think about you know, how we plan that out, how much data we're bringing in, and what that really looks like um, in order to, you know, we don't want to bring in a massive table if really only we need is four fields and we're going to aggregate those up anyways. Um, so what I wanted to do is just kind of show you an example of something I mocked up, um, but based off of, you know, some real life examples I've had as to how I would do that. So this one. And what I mocked up were some fake help desk data. Um, and I created a flow, um, you know, mocked up this information. And it looks like I moved that field, uh, that file when I was cleaning up my desktop. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm, I've got a number of steps to clean this data. And then down here, what I'm doing is really aggregating that information. And then what I did was I said, okay, you know, my help desk, we really want to know, you know, what kind of tickets we're having. We're going to summarize all that. But really what my group is focused on is why are we having repeat tickets? So what I can do is actually create a branch right here that's going to have all my aggregated information. And then up here, what I can do is create another branch and then I'm going to just bring in my details. So these are going to be just the repeat tickets. So I would do that by just creating a branch and then filtering for just those uh, repeat instances. And now I've got two different data sources that I can bring into desktop. I don't need to bring the whole table in and then you know, create a flag of what's a repeat and then just filter out those repeats. What I can do is have the two different data sets and really kind of carve out just the level of detail records or that low level of detail records that I need. Um, and again, I'm more than happy to, you know, share any of these flows. They're all fake data um, that I've made up. So um, that's what I had today, Tim. Are there any questions, anything that anyone wants me to review or go over? No questions in the chat yet. Okay. Um, uh, folks out there watching, if you have questions for Kate, go ahead and pop them in. Oh, we just got one came through just now. Okay. And it is um, the one that we always see when we talk about Tableau prep and it's the Altrix comparison. Yeah. yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. So I think, you know, I think they're different tools. Um, I think prep has come a long way. So I think it depends on what are you doing with Altrix? Um, and if you have a creator license, it will, it's going to depend on your license type of what you've got. Um, but you can always download a 14 day copy of prep. So if you are using Alteryx really just to do data prep work, I would definitely take a look at prep. Um, prep. They just released an enhancement where you can write to a database now in prep. So if you have that permission to write, you can do some of that aggregation 
and you know populate that in a database now which i think kind of some people were still holding on to all tricks for that so i really see them you know as different tools and i think it kind of depends on what you want to do with it um, but i'd really encourage you if you haven't used prep to either download the trial copy or if you have it as part of your creator license uh, to download it and play around with it and see if it will work for you you know if you're doing a lot of spatial work um, in Alteryx, which I think is kind of traditionally what a lot of people have done in Alteryx. I don't know that, you know, prep is really what you want, but if you're doing, you know, data set cleaning, aggregating, combining that sort of thing, I would definitely take a look at prep. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, just in my experience, I've found that that prep is significantly easier to learn, right? It's yeah. just, so if you're just starting out on either of these tools, um, prep is, yeah. is a good introduction. Um, and a prep's come a long way, right? Since it was released, uh, what is it, two years at this point? Uh, yeah, it was, I think, February of 18. So, yeah. And it's, it's come a long way and that, that writing to, uh, writing to databases is huge. Yes, um, it is. Yeah. 2020.3 20, update. Yep. That's Can I also put a plug in for something, Tim? Yeah. I'm going to put a plug in for prepping data. Um, so this is, a, I meant to do this up front, this is a community project. So if you're new to prep, um, this is a great, even if you're not new to prep, there are some like mind bending challenges. Um, so the team, you can see over here, uh, Jenny Martin's writing a lot of the challenges right now. And what's great about prepping data is it's fake data that you can download. They're going to give you um, the step by steps. And then you'll also see, so here you can see this is week 33. You're going to have the challenge. They're going to give you the file. They're going to give you some hints and you can compare your output. And then the following week, they're going to give you a solution. So if you got stumped on it, you can kind of come back and you can see the solution. And there's also a, um, a community group for prepping data where they're you know, posting some videos and the flows um, that they did to solve it. And this, I think, will really kind of maybe potentially change your mind about prep. And it will also introduce you to some of those functions like write to database um, and the new calculations where you can do LOD and row numbers. So big plug out and shout out for these guys because what they do is awesome work. Absolutely. Yeah. So desktop has quite a few community projects. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to see that prep is kind of following suit. And uh, it's a great way to improve your skills, right? If yeah. you don't find you're using this in um, your full-time job, this is a great, uh, great way to kind of sharpen those skills and level up, so to speak. Yes, yep. And some of these are really hard from someone who uses prep all the time. I'm like, what are they doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely worth taking um, a look at those. We had one more request come through and it was uh, to flip back to your reason number two um, uh, on your PowerPoint slide. Reason number two, sure. The point and click cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Someone had uh, missed that. So they just wanted to see that one more time. Yep. And, you know, that's, that's one of the easiest things, the best things about, uh, about prep, right? Is how easy it is to, to start manipulating things and, and the, to the speed to market, how easy it is to get things up and running. So, yep. Absolutely. And it's, it's really cool too, um, you know, Tim, what I think is when you start to make the changes, what you can do is you can come in here and see, you know, how those changes are happening and what they're doing in the side panel. Um, so it will give you, you know, a clue as to what's happening within that. So if you, you know, you're coming in and you're pointing and click, clicking, but you want to understand more about what's happening, you can always come in here too and look at these and edit it to see what's the calculation they did to have that happen. You know, so this is very simple. It's just, you know, wrapping in an upper, which you may be familiar with um, either in SQL or desktop, but it gives you another place that you can come in and kind of learn and look at how those calculations work. Agree, absolutely. All right, so if there are any more questions for Kate, feel free to pop them into the Q&A. We will keep an eye on that going forward. Um, so thank you, Kate. That was thank extremely you. helpful. Um, we haven't done a lot of prep um, content as a group. 
So uh, this is really great and uh, I hope folks find this valuable. Awesome. And feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thanks. Thank you. So I will share my screen again and bring in our next guest. Let's see here. One moment. All right. So our next guest today is I think we lost him again. Tim? Or was it me? No, you're good. You're you're on. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you want, is your presentation, I'm assuming it's on your there's Tim. Tim's back. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, let's see. You're good, man. Sorry, You're on. Guys. Nah, so Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, okay, I can do it. Let me, I'll go ahead and share my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulty. Sorry, guys. So, um, I'll, I'll introduce myself in a second, but I just want to say welcome. Thank you for having me today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about worst case scenario survival guides. And specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, the dashboard requirements edition of this uh, book. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking from a very much a beginner's journey to survive some of these worst things that you could possibly be asked to do with Tableau. Um, so now the title is the survival handbook, right? But this is really a call to be creative. Um, and I hope at the end of this, you're gonna feel empowered to survive some of these worst case things that you'll come across. So, um, First, who am I? So my name is Mark Bradborn. Um, I've been in business intelligence and analytics for about 20, it'll be 23 years in October. Um, I have a certification from the Data Warehouse Institute in business analytics. I've got a qualified associate degree or certification from Tableau. Um, I currently work for Tableau as a solutions engineer. Um, I've worked for a ton of different companies as a practitioner. Um, but none of this absolutely qualifies me to talk about any of the stuff that I'm going to talk about right now. Um, really, it's just sharing my experience of all of the things that I've been asked to do and, and most of the things I've refused to do. Um, so hopefully along the way, you'll, you'll learn a few things. Um, so let me introduce you to Mark. Now, this is not me. This is Mark with a C. Um, so he's just getting his first job working with data visualization, but he's super excited um, because he gets to uh, use Tableau. He's so excited, he can literally run through walls. There he is, just on cue. Um, and he's been practicing. He's been learning uh, using the community um, with Tableau, which is amazing. Um, he's been doing things like Workout Wednesday. He's been doing Makeover Mondays. He's been reading awesome community blogs. And he's even been reading a bunch of books, like just getting down his best practices. He is awesome. He's ready. He's ready to go. So he heads in to his first meeting with stakeholders and they start to share their vision of this new state of the art, game changing visual masterpiece of design. And then he walks out and he feels a little deflated. They have asked for some things that he knows aren't best practice, and it's definitely not the best way to use Tableau or any data visualization tool for that matter. So the struggle truly is real. But Mark is armed with knowledge. He knows that in these situations, it is called for creativity. If nothing else, he's armed with two things, and these are the two things that you need to be aware of. Use the appropriate chart type at the right time, and how to employ pre-attentive attributes to your advantage. These two things alone can make your dashboard shine. Um, so, you know, Mark is going to now help me demonstrate what I refer to as your seven deadly sins of data visualization. If anybody ever says to you, I need to export, um, I need the be all end all, the dashboard that answers every question I have. Um, if somebody asks you to make it look like Excel, um, you know, if they want, if someone to, comes to you and asks you to build a specific chart type before you even see the data, um, if they want you to overcolor things, um, they might 
want you to provide them filters for a column that has millions of records, you know, you know, individual records, um, or they might ask you for stoplight visuals. These are your seven deadly sins. These are the things that we fight to avoid. So <laughs> exporting to Excel or PowerPoint. Now, this one hurts me the most. It breaks my heart. Um, it's the first requirement they ask for is the ability to export the Excel. I mean, why are they so mean? The first question you need to ask when somebody asks this is, well, what are you gonna do with it after you export it? If they say something like, oh, I'm gonna paste it into this Excel workbook and I, it runs a bunch of macros, try and resist the urge to club them to death with the nearest blunt object. The workbook is the real requirement. So get that, ask for that workbook because that's what you need to develop. You need to develop what their true requirement is. Um, now, in some organizations with strict data governance policies, this is a huge issue when data leaves that certified source. So use that as leverage if you have to. Um, if they're looking to export it to PowerPoint, show them the story feature inside Tableau. Um, if they have access to web authoring, show them how they can create their own stories and use live tool to interact with the data rather than having its static image in PowerPoint where it's not living anymore. Now, ultimately, if they do need it in PowerPoint, show them the easy way to export it from the tool rather than making them take screenshots. Sometimes it's better to live to fight another day. So I've been asked before, is it possible to create a dashboard that would answer any possible question that I could ever have? Now, I mean, how would that even work? So we all know that there's no possible way to create that dashboard. Um, I mean, it's just, it, just doesn't make sense. It boggles my mind that somebody would ask that question. Um, but get your users instead to focus on what those critical questions are. The, you know, the things that keep them up at night, you know, the ones if they don't have a quick answer to, that it could be their job or somebody else's job on the line. Once you have those questions, then you can start answering those questions and then move to the next set of questions. Um, you know, if these are analysts, again, show them how they can explore a certified data source using web authoring or get them a desktop license. If find if you teach a person to fish rather than give them a fish, it can be a lot more effective um, as long as they start following best practices. Hopefully Mark with a C will share his uh, getting started resources. Um, now, if they claim to need it all on a single dashboard, this is another fight that you may have. Um, but I always make the argument, you know, if they've got to scroll five or six screens worth to get it all on one screen, is it really on one screen? I mean, the answer is no. Um, you know, don't be afraid to break, break it up for them, show them the options, use navigation, just give them a better user experience. Because the truth is a lot of times they don't know what they're asking for and they just don't know what they don't know. Um, and that's the reason we see so much struggle in this area because um, they just don't know how to use the tool. So we've got to train them, right? So one of the cool things that I've seen done recently is people will shoot a five minute video capturing their screen um, to an, embed that on the first page of the dashboard and walk them through how they actually will interact with the dashboard. It's like a little job aid that's embedded right in your dashboard. Um, you know, knowledge is power. You make your users strong. Urgh. <laughs> All right, so this one hurts. Um, and I feel like when this came up on the screen, I felt everybody's head nod like, yep, I've, I've had this question. Um, you know, so please, please don't recreate Excel in Tableau. Um, if this is what people are used to seeing, we need to educate them and push them to be better to a more visual place. Um, give them a view of the data eventually, but don't let that be the first view. So, you know, really, we just got to say, no, we're not doing that. I mean, using something like a highlight table is a good first step away from Excel because we start to employ pre-attentive attributes. And those are the attributes, you know, that the brain processes in 250 milliseconds or less. Um, we're still showing them the facts and figures in this view, but here we're using color to, and, and the actual number in concert. Um, so here, like very quickly, we could see that the profit ratio of machines in Q4 2018 was in the tank. Um, we can see that without scanning the rows and columns and comparing the numbers in our mind to the last one that we saw and is it bigger or smaller, the color draws us to that insight. Um, you know, we can also see the profit ratio on tables has always been a problem. It's amazing what a little bit of color can do. 
Now, if we start to push things a little bit further, if maybe if we know that they're comparing sales with profits, we can use a, a bar uh, to show the length of the sale and then the color of the profit. We can use these two pre-attentive pre attributes together, length and color. Um, so here, like we can see that chairs and phones are consistently high sellers and the profits are good. Tables again stand out, but now we can see that the sales are in the mid range of the products and maybe we need to apply the, the selling model for machines to the tables line. Again, we add these pre attentive attributes. Not only do we find insights, but we can start to craft actions and potential actions that we can make for improvement. Um, any way you slice it, um, it's going to be better than the raw data. So be creative and give them alternate views. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've built four or five different visuals to see what they like best, to see what they resonate with. The trick is that, um, you know, what are they able to understand? Everybody's data literacy level is a little different. And based on that, you can employ the right chart type um, and ultimately lead to a better solution. So um, I, what I want is this specific chart type. Um, if you're plugged into the community at all, you know that there are phases that people go through when a chart type gets hot. Um, I've seen Sankey phases, I've seen Mary Mecco phases. We, when animations came out, we got a lot of bar chart races and it's fun to experiment. Don't get me wrong, I do it all the time. Um, but some of those can be difficult to produce. Um, they're great for static views, but if we're talking about production environments. Um, it's not, not great. And some of these truly aren't best practices. Um, they can be difficult to understand for, for someone who's got a low level of data literacy. So really, we, we need to say no on this too. Um, here is where a great tool like the visual vocabulary, um, which was originally created by the Financial Times in the UK. Um, this version was lovingly created or recreated by Andy Kriebel. Um, it's out on Tableau Public. I think it's if you've been viewed like well over a million times at this point. Bookmark it. Um, it's a great way to know you know, if they're asking for a specific type of, you know, data and they've got a specific type of question, this will actually help lead to the type of visualization that may be the best one to use. Now, I'm going to pick on pie charts since I deal with a lot of financial institutions and pie charts um, are kind of like the fifth food group there. So, um, but they are a part to whole visualization. So while the pie chart is a member of that group of business, it might not be the best to experiment with. So, if we go into that part to whole, we have our food charts. We've got our pies, our donuts, and our waffles. Um, now of these, if you're showing like a single number, a waffle chart's not a bad idea to do it kind of as a, a big ass number. Um, the tree map might be a decent choice. Um, you know, if you're, it's a little bit easier to compare rectangles um, versus like slices of pie might, might work. Um, you know, stacked bars and columns work well. Um, but again, it depends. So let's take a look at a couple of examples uh, to see it in context. So if somebody comes to you with this, uh, it's too many slices, it's too many colors. No, let's not do that. So it's talking about a tree map. It might be okay to replace it with this. Again, it might depend on the number of slices or, or different aspects that you're looking at. Squares and rectangles are easier to compare sizes, um, but it's not super great because you still got to do some comparisons with um, the labels. And if you're not sure what the square is actually sized on, um, it can be a little confusing. So like if I look at, uh, you know, machines here, I've got this 1.8%. Well, obviously that's not the size, 32%. So this is definitely based on the, the dollar value. So it can be a little bit confusing if, um, you know, again, they're not super data literate or they're just not paying attention. So maybe. Um, now, shockingly, this one represents the data really well. And it wasn't part of the part to whole on the visual vocabulary. Um, and this I show to truly drive home the point that it truly does depend on what you're trying to show, what the granularity of the data uh, is, and ultimately what the situation is. Um, in this case, the bar chart, or as I like to call it, the Swiss army knife of data visualization, um, it saves the day. Easy comparisons, clean groups, um, sorting that tells us a concise story. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's give them the bar chart today. Um, I highly recommend this book uh, for data visualization practices. Don't try to buy it, it's not real. 
Okay, so um, filtering is great. Truly, truly, truly it's great. Um, but filtering by hard, high cardinality fields or fields that have a ton of unique values can be problematic at best. Um, from a performance standpoint, it can slow down your dashboard because it queries that list every time you use it. Um, it can be unfriendly to users if they've got to scroll and scroll to find the value if they're not sure and they're not able to search for it. Um, and if there are other filters in place, something like this can yield some unintended results and you can end up with a blank dashboard if the filters end up colliding. So we've got to give them a hard no on that. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, one way around this is to offer up the ability to, with sets and groups um, to, to put those values together that are going to be the ones that are most of interest to the user. Um, and this can be a game changer. So if they're not familiar with, um, if you, I'm sorry, if you aren't familiar with sets, sets are dynamic groupings based on data. So in this case, I'm looking at our highest profiting customers or our VIP customers. So very quickly I go from, you know, several thousand customers to a top 10. Um, in this example, this set is showing my problem customers. So the ones that have the lowest profit ratios. Um, finding what they're focusing on and grouping those things, what they want to see regularly can go a long way. Um, you know, here I'm showing the highest sales, but the profits are vastly different. So, you know, combining these things and moving these things around can add insights to what they're trying to do. But again, it's getting down to those requirements to understand what they're actually looking for, um, which is the hard part at times. And lastly, one a great option for filtering is giving them value ranges. Now, every value in your, or every, yeah, every value in your database, you know, there's a record associated with that, but integers filter faster than strings. So doing something like this, where I'm giving them a profit ratio range, I'm gonna see much better performance, a lot of flexibility around this. Um, you know, so be creative with your filtering. Um, and if you start to see an issue, don't forget that you can use the Tableau Performance Recorder feature. Um, that's located in the help menu of Tableau Desktop. Um, you start and stop it, it opens a new workbook, it tells you where uh, some of your problem areas are. Um, great knowledge base article for that. Um, head out to Tableau's website to find that. Um, so yeah, um, be careful with your filtering. Um, please color every X. Uh, I jokingly call this my taste the rainbow slide. Um, but yeah, I think not. Let's not do this. I remember when I first started using Tableau in 2012, I always thought it was fun, like when I just was starting to grab a ridiculous field and apply that to color. And then I would quickly remove it because it was ridiculous and unusable. Um, color is a powerful pre-attentive attribute and people will argue that length or width may be stronger. But for me, color is one of the most uh, powerful and probably the most commonly abused. So you gotta be careful. Um, science tells us that humans can remember five colors, plus or minus two, depending on the human, before they have to start going back and referring to the legend. So keep that in mind as you're applying color to your visualizations. So let's not apply it to everything. So here we're coloring by state. Now there's not a chance. There's no chance I have an idea what that pink color is because the shades are too close together. Could be Kentucky, might be North Carolina, could be Oregon, don't know. Now each time I've set a state, you probably looked at the legend trying to find that shade of pink to figure out which one I'm talking about. And now imagine that your users are going to be doing that every time, all the time. Now in these situations, you want to provide a higher grouping uh, and then drill down to something more manageable uh, using, you know, dashboard actions or set actions um, to get down into that detail. Don't be afraid to give them a guided path. So here, just by moving the color from state to region, it's a little bit more uh, palatable, right? So like I can look, I can see that central is blue. Um, and then from here, I can employ navigation or set actions and then drill down. One of the things that, that I do the most um, is actually do a one versus many. So I'll drop everything to gray and then I'll use a parameter to apply color to the one I'm interested in the most. Um, and then by simplifying this colors, we make our visualizations way more effective. So if I'm focused on California, I know exactly where all of my California data points are. And then if I were to switch that parameter, 
all of those that state would float to the top. So, so this is definitely something to consider. Now, speaking of color, um, this is my favorite story. Um, stoplight is a very common ask. Um, so once upon a time, uh, back when dinosaurs room, roamed the earth in about 2006, um, I was working for a CFO uh, who was colorblind. Now he thought it would be funny, he hid that from me. Um, and he asked for a scorecard, red, yellow, green. Um, now why he asked me for that, I, I still don't know. I never got a chance to ask him. Um, maybe he just didn't realize how bad his color deficiency was. Now either way, I developed what he asked for. Um, I presented it to him, I was really happy with it. And then he looked at me, he goes, I have no idea what any of this means. And that was the day I learned a valuable lesson. You color the good, you color the bad, but not both. Um, if you do color both, you have to test for accessibility and you have to use icons or indicators as a secondary measure for clarity. So, so don't, don't do that. So in this example, I actually provided the option to color the good, leave it neutral or color it bad. So, and what I experienced in, uh, you know, 12 years ago, uh, made me very sensible, sensitive to, uh, to accessibility, um, which is why I, I use a few, few tools to test. So, so be very careful with mixing your reds and greens. Now, I talked about tools to test. Um, the first one that I use, um, I use it on my phone. Uh, it's called Sim Daltonism. And if you're ever at a meeting with me and you see me pull out my phone and point it at the screen, I'm not taking a picture of the slide. Chances are I'm testing it for accessibility because I'm a crazy person like that. Um, but it's great because it'll actually uh, do about 10 different types of color deficiency um, and it'll show you the results. Um, so yeah, Sim Daltonism is the, the iPhone app. I'm pretty sure there's a similar one for Android, but I don't know what that's called. So forgive me. Um, and then if you're like working with Tableau server, there's a Chrome extension called Spectrum. Um, just you install it, you turn it on, you can pull your viz up in Tableau server um, and it will actually test the entire browser for accessibility. It's a fantastic uh, tool for, for checking your vizs. And I recommend like any viz you create, um, check it for accessibility to make sure what you're seeing is going to be what the same with someone uh, who has some visual uh, deficiency, like the experience will be similar. So, um, so if there's any questions, uh, I don't know if there's any come up in the chat, um, but we'll uh, happily answer some of those. If you don't get a chance or if you just want to connect with me, you can tweet at me at Mark Bradborn. Um, you don't have to use the hashtag because it's not like I'm going to be inundated with a bunch of questions. I'll catch them, um, but I will do my best to answer your questions. So with that one again, thank you for having me and Mark with a C. Uh, I appreciate the time and uh, appreciate the invite. And hopefully we'll see you all in person very soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, and again, sorry for my uh, <laughs> dropping in and out there. Um, so if anyone has any questions for Mark, like you mentioned, pop them into the Q&A. We'll uh, monitor that for the next few minutes here. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. And here. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to make note of is um, if you're on Tableau Public, if you're on Twitter, I, I would encourage you to go check out Mark and Kate's uh, Tableau Public profile. Um, I've never told Mark this, but uh, he was one of the people unknowingly that got me involved with the Tableau Public community. Um, you know, I used to follow Makeover Monday and I used to try to recreate those every Monday. And uh, he was religious in doing his um, and posting it and, and sharing it with the community. And uh, his was one of them that I followed. And uh, that really got me motivated to kind of share my work and, and start to uh, be more active in that community. Um, and being more active in that community helps you kind of gain certain skills and, and learn things you might not normally learn. So um, that's my kind of <laughs> two cents on, on encouraging folks to get out there and, and, and check out what's in the greater Tableau community. So, uh, uh, hey, real quick, sorry, yeah. Tim. Hey, Mark, is where can I find that presentation? Sorry if I missed that. Is this out on your Tableau public profile? Um, yeah, so you can actually find, I, um, so there's a, a workbook that's sitting out there that has kind of some preset, um, 
it's not necessarily the presentation, but it's like a workbook that you can actually go download and kind of work through and build different views based on the data. Um, but if, if somebody wants that presentation, I can send the, the uh, PDF of it out. That would be great because the reason Tim and I were texting each other back and forth, because we actually uh, presented a style guide today at American Airlines <laughs> and your presentation was pretty much verbatim. We're talking about colors. We want to emphasize the good, have a, have a neutral color, emphasize the bad, have a neutral color. Don't want to emphasize both. Uh, and then one of the guys, one of the managers wants a stoplight and you know, we were trying to convince them otherwise, hey, that's not a best practice. So I guess having access to your, to your presentations just um, validates the methodology that we want to implement, so. Yeah, no, happy, happy to send it. I'll send it to Tim and I'll let him distribute it. Awesome. Um, I, there's a couple of questions that I just saw in the Q&A. Um, Siddhar asked how to stop download CSVs from, from the URL. Um, I'm not exactly sure from the URL, but I know inside uh, Tableau server, there's a permission where you can actually explicitly deny uh, downloading data. Um, and one thing that you can do to make it a little more difficult is when you create your tooltips, um, turn off the command buttons um, and that takes away the, um, some of the easier ways to download the data. Um, the other question I see from Juanita was, do I use the color wheel in order to avoid um, many bright colors? Um, there's a whole host of tools that you can use um, for uh, color. I actually have read a bunch of color theory books um, where you start talking about, um, you know, triple and quad, quad uh, color palettes. Um, there's some some really good tools. There's a tool from Canva, um, which you can actually upload an image and get a five color palette uh, hex value, uh, which is nice. Like if you found a nice picture of nature and you're looking for a you know a natural palette. Um, the other one is uh, Paloton, um, not to be confused with the bike, um, but uh, it's great. You can put in your starting. Like I worked for a company whose corporate color was red, which is problematic when it comes to data visualization because you know red is a negative connotation to it. But I put in that hex value and then it would give me complementary colors to that one. So I used that to build my color palette from. So it was in the same color family, but different hues. So um, a lot of tools, uh, if you just Google, um, you know, color palettes for data visualization, you'll find a ton of, of resources. Uh, any other questions? I'll go ahead and get those in now. Um, <clears throat> due to kind of our, some of our technical difficulties, we think we're going to cut it short after this. Uh, so I want to thank Mark. I want to thank Kate for helping us out today, for joining us and sharing your knowledge and your presentations. Um, we think uh, the community seems to love it. A lot of good feedback in the chat. Um, and I would encourage everyone out there to go check out Mark and Kate's profile on public. And I think, uh, Kate, are you still there? Is that uh, the presentation you shared today? Is that uh, is that available on your public profile? It is not, but I can make it up. I can put it up there. Okay. I'll convert it into uh, Tableau. Right. And if anyone so, wants, you know, the um, the flows that I uh, put together, just you know, get in touch with me, and I can package them up and send them over too. So. Uh, we got one more question, Mark, and that was um, a link to the color palette you just mentioned, the website. Oh, yeah. One second. Let me dig it up. Hey, while you're doing that, uh, are you presenting this at uh, TC20? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I think it's everything. Some people need to see this. So. <laughs> I say I did. I did this for the Data Fam Community Jam, so I know it's been recorded at least once, now twice. Um, so I just pasted the Paloton link into uh, the chat, and I'll do the Canva one here in one second. Yeah, and here's here's Canva. So I use both of these tools um, for creating color palettes.
So if there are no other questions, I'll go give everyone a minute to go grab those links. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, oh, TC20 is happening virtually. Um, details are coming out September 1st. It's going to be October 6th, 7th, and 8th. So thank you all for joining today. Join us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I will, well, you know, we're skipping over our tip of the month today, but uh, you know, I, once I get my internet connection stable again, I will go ahead and record that and share that on our LinkedIn group. Um, so you guys can take a look at that. Um, also, we will share uh, the presentation recordings from today's meeting in that group as well. So I wanna thank everyone again. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Joey. Uh, any last thoughts, folks, before we uh, kind of jump out here? Go Pats! <laughs> Go Browns! <laughs> Dirty Pats! <laughs> yeah. All right, y'all. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and have a great uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Bye, Joey. Bye.